Hi there. Today I'm going to talk about a book which is in the Officer Survival category and is uh, a very important work. And it's the book, um, The New Hall Massacre, The uh, Tactical Analysis by Michael Wood. And uh, it was a very significant uh, event. Uh, it happened in 1970, and um, I started shooting about four years later. And uh, it, it was something that was in the literature. And it, uh, I, I certainly heard a lot about it, read a lot about it. And one of the things the book does is dispel some of the myths. It, it confirms a lot of the facts and does dispel some of the, some of the myths. And I, I was uh, alerted to the book after uh, watching a podcast by Lee Weems. Now, Lee is uh, a very uh, significant firearms instructor in Georgia. I, I met him a couple of times when I was down there. Uh, a great shooter, and he has a podcast. I'll put the link to it. It's a very interesting podcast. He's had lots of guys on, uh, and recently they've been talking about the history of the modern technique um, I'll, I'll quite a bit with guys who are intimately involved in the development. So, so that's been interesting. Anyway, so one of the podcasts they were talking about significant incidents in, in police, uh, the evolution of police training, and Newhall was the uh, first one they talked about. So um, just a, an overview, um, a, a California Highway Patrol unit, two-man unit, officers Frago and Gore were tasked to investigate uh, a, a, a report of brandishing, which is somebody waving a revolver back. He'd actually threatened uh, a fellow motorist with the revolver. So they come across the car, and they put a stop in, and the car stops, but it stops in a choke point. Now, what, one of the lessons was that the officers could well have ordered the car to move further into the parking area, which would have given them a better position. What it also would have done was alter the whole timing of the incident, and it probably would not have then been the incident it became it probably would have just been a routine arrest. So um, they ordered the driver out of the car. At first he doesn't comply, but then he does. And uh, Officer Gore goes forward to um, handcuff, well, search and handcuff him. Uh, in a, got him in a car rest position. Officer Frago, who's carrying the shotgun, also moves forward to the passenger side, which in America is the right hand side. And he has, he takes the shotgun in one hand and with his left hand starts to open the passenger door, whereupon the passenger kills him, shoots him, one shot dead, and exits the vehicle. And Officer Gore then exchanges shots with him across the car, doesn't hit him and uh, is shot uh, by the other guy who has produced a, a firearm from his uh, waistband. Thereupon, a backup car arrives with officers uh, Allen and Pence, and th they are under fire immediately. Uh, Officer Allen gets out with a shotgun, and um, he racks it, uh, twice. He, he racks it to chamber around, but then as he moves forward, he racks around out. Um, he is, there's a gunfire, he's killed, and Officer Pence runs out of ammo without hitting anyone, and as he's reloading, he just finishes getting six rounds into the revolver, and when he's killed. And that's basically a, a, a uh, snapshot of the incident. Obviously, there's a lot of detail. The book does go into it in terrific detail, and um, the lessons to be learned. 
So what uh, Michael Wood does is he takes Masai Yub's um, uh, framework of uh, mindset tactics, techniques, uh, equipment and so on, and he analyzes it from all those points of view. Um, so the firearms training, we start, starting off with the firearms training. Now, California Highway Patrol had um, what at the time was a pretty standard firearms training program. It wasn't the best in the United States and it by no means was the worst. It was more or less the no what you might call the normal for a, a large department. Now, I, I wrote a piece many years ago about the history of police firearms training and um, really it all comes from um, recreational shooting, sport shooting. If you look at it, the techniques, they were mainly using one-handed uh, Olympic style uh, shooting, which is from sport. And every pistol range would be uh, 25 yards which is the standard uh, Olympic uh, distance. Some, sometimes they'd be 50 yards because the, there is 50 yard uh, sport shooting as well, but they would always be at least 25 yards. Uh, why not 24 yards or 26? It was always 25. So it, it, <clears throat> the whole thing was based on sport. And um, usually the instructors had a background in recreational shooting and this influenced uh, everything they did. So um, the officers involved in, in the uh, New Hall were all um, qualified shots. They'd all done well in training. Uh, and particularly um, Officer Gore had, had done particularly well, but then he missed uh, a very close range target, the width of a car, uh, he didn't hit him at all. And um, the question about firearms training then is, does it prepare you for reality? And Masayub in his excellent stress fire addresses the point because he was doing a lot of research in, in police training and, and departments Perhaps the most tragic mistake of all was that in the history of combat handgun training, from the days of the duelist to the FBI system to the new pistol craft, the master instructors had built their training systems on techniques that worked on the artificial proving grounds of the training and competition ranges. When the techniques failed on the street under stress, it was so easy to say, we know what works for pure shooting, we can teach our student that. If he can't make it work on the street, that's his problem because we can't graft on a new set of balls and give him courage. It was a cruel cop-out. The police firearms instructor or his counterparts in the private academies cannot shirk his responsibility so easily. By definition, he is there to teach not merely marksmanship, but combat. And that was the problem. And to a large extent, it still is today. Um, I, I made the point uh, uh, to a training course that you could go through the entire program at the major police training departments or federal training departments and qualify as an expert without ever once having been in the same mental state that you would be in a gunfight. <clears throat> So one of the problems was that uh, CHP saw themselves not so much a law enforcement agency as a traffic management agency. And they kind of downplayed the hard skills of law enforcement. So another issue um, that's been talked about a lot is the revolver. It, it was universal in the police. Um, they, they were armed with six shot revolvers. There were exceptions. Um, the book mentioned El Monte, uh, another California department, which used the 45 auto. And I remember um, seeing an article about them 
and they were actually using um, uh, front rake holsters, which were what was being developed um, by the um, Jeff Cooper's um, circle. Uh, 45 pistols from front rake, uh, front rake holsters. And I, I think Cell Reed had input to them, to that particular department. Uh, revolvers can be fine. Uh, Jim Cirillo won his gunfights with revolvers. Evan Marshall won his gunfights mainly with revolvers. Um, they can be fine, but it's got to be backed up by the training and the mindset. So um, one of the issues was the reloading of the revolver. Um, and um, Officer Pence um, uh, was reloading and uh, was killed during the reloading. And I just want to talk a little bit, this, this will kind of become a, a little bit of a kit discussion about reloading the revolver. The method that was used by CHP were these, the dump pouch. And the dump pouch is arguably the worst method for carrying and um, re carrying ammo and reloading the revolver. <clears throat> what you do, this is on a belt, you unsnap it and there's a, an internal pouch that falls and the ammunition falls into your hand. And I'll just, if I turn my hand around, you can see the ammunition has gone all different ways. Some, some are full of Ford, some are um, Primer Ford. These are dummy rounds, drill rounds, which I've kept from the old days um, for article purposes and so on. They're not, I don't have any live ammunition anymore. So you've got, you've got these rounds in your hand and then you've got to put them one at a time and the, they're all at odd angles and so on. And sometimes all the ammo doesn't fall out of the dump pouch anyway. Uh, it, it's worse than reloading from loops, from belt loops. Uh, the problem with belt loops is they're open to uh, the elements, but, but it's not an a, impossible task to have belt loops that have a flap, okay? Now these particular belt loops, this, I think you can see there, are two by two. So the ammunition is grouped in pairs and without too much dexterity, you can actually take two cartridges at a time and pop them in to the cylinder. That's not too much of a problem. So that would have, would have been possible for them to have. There, there are a pouch design. Uh, this one is from DeSantis, and it's similar to the dump pouch. You flip it, but then the inner doesn't fall. It just comes out at an angle, and you've got your two by two ammunition there. Uh, that's a much better system and I actually had one made locally here by a leather company uh, because I wanted it for my Charter Bulldog 44 Special and uh, DeSantis didn't make it in that calibre so I had, had it made uh, now speed loaders came along and to CHP's um, credit they did authorise them and later issued them. Now the problem with the speed loader, or a problem with the speed loader and, and its pouch is it's as bulky almost as the revolver. It's fast and it, it's, it's uh, much easier to use, but it's fairly bulky. So for plain clothes or for covert use, these kind of things uh, are still a useful thing. And um, another, another um, method which I don't have to hand a speed strips which are nephrine strips that go in the pouch and they load uh, two at a time. Uh, obviously it's much easier to load a semi-auto. You have a magazine with eight to twenty rounds it's in your hand it's, it's 
easy to grasp and just insert in one one hit. So that's just a little thing on the re reloading. Um, so the next thing to talk about would be tactics. Now, the tactical training for CHP was pathetic. They uh, actually spent more time talking about the history of California than they did on tactics. And the time they did a lot to tactics, the bulk of it was classroom. And then there was very little just measured in hours spent actually out doing it with vehicles. And what they really needed to do was um, lots of repetitions and open-ended um, scenarios where the outcome is based on the officer's actions. And uh, things like you can have compliance, you can have non-compliant, you can have drunken, you can have people with um, altered states, you can have uh, multiple occupants, you can have vans, different types of configuration vehicles, this kind of thing, and go through the tactics for each situation. Um, I, I will say that, that uh, even now, uh, our police here, they spend more time on uh, diversity training than they do on hard skills, uh, typically. So it's a problem that still remains. Now, the tactical training was lacking, but the actual tactics weren't too bad. The tactics taught for what they called a hot stop was fairly uh, sensible tactic. Unfortunately, officers um, Gordon Frago ignored the tactics. They went forward, uh, both approached the vehicles, and uh, th that wasn't the tactic. The idea was to get the guys out of the vehicles. The tactics evolved almost straight away after New Hall, and, and they brought in even even better tactics. Um, one of the things that the book mentions, uh, Michael Wood mentions in the book, was the concept of um, contact and cover. Uh, but that con that concept was really only developed in 1984 uh, in San Diego after an incident there where two of their officers were killed, and it was developed by uh, Lieutenant or Lieutenant uh, John Morrison, um, and it was widely promulgated, and they made a training film of it, and that's where really contact and cover came into its own. Had they stayed back from the target vehicle, they would have used distance, which equals time, which equals options. And also, it would have given time for the backup officers to arrive, and it may have all turned into a non-event. But instead, they went forward. And uh, as... The, the two bad guys, one, one of them uh, committed suicide and one was arrested. And, um, but they both made statements be before. And um, uh, the statement was he, he got careless or wasted him. So um, that, that was a big learning point. What the book does, it's a great analysis of the incident and there's many learning points and they're discussed in detail, far more detail than, than I've gone into or can go into here. But one of the things it does is dispel some myths and there were myths. And one of them that I, I'd heard of and actually had believed was that one of the officers was found, uh, it, it, it was uh, Officer Pence, when he was reloading the revolver, they said he'd taken the ammunition, uh, the empty cases and put them in his pocket before reloading from his belt loops one at a time. And this related back to the range training practices were um, to keep the range uh, immaculate. Uh, that was a fallacy, that never happened. The, the cases were found on the ground. Um, but there was a, a, a widespread practice that they used to have a can for you to dump the empty cases in. So part of the reloading would be to look for a can. So it's a bit of a training scar there. 
Um, the book goes into uh, a timeline of the development of uh, firearms training over the years from very rudimentary, almost non-existent training up to modern, modern days. And it's really good and it's in-depth. <clears throat> One of the things it, it does emphasize is how important um, high-level sim, simulation training uh, is, is uh, essential. Uh, and uh, the verbal slip I made there was simulations because simulations are a component of it. Uh, uh, force on force training. Uh, however, back in, many years ago, some people were playing around or experimenting with wax bullets or cottonwood bullets fired from a revolver. And since they were using revolvers, it, it was very realistic. Uh, we did quite a bit of it over here, uh, particularly for the bodyguard training. We, we use wax bullets and uh, they, they work fairly well. Obviously, when semi missions came along, they were they were even better. But um, you know, it, it shows that you can um, solve problems. One of the problems with um, simulations, uh, force on force, is it's uh, time intensive, and it's easy to put if you've got to train a hundred guys, put them on the firing line, have turning targets. So everyone's shooting together, they get through the the session and everyone goes and you can you can spend a morning and they've done the whole program. To train a hundred people in uh, scenarios one at a time, plus the debrief, uh, is very time intensive and uh, it's difficult to do. And because it's difficult, a lot of people avoid it and that's the cop out. It's, shouldn't be avoided it's the same that is the training that's what people should be training on and the um, the anomaly is that a lot of smaller departments actually train their guys better because they can on a training day they might only have 10 people and put them through a scenario whereas the massive big city departments who've got to train thousands of officers never get around to doing it so uh I know I've gone on quite a bit and we've covered lots of subjects on this book. It was such an important book, uh, it, it's revelationary, and uh, I certainly got, got a lot out of it and I recommend it to anyone in the business. Even though the incident happened in 1970, the lessons are still there to be learned and some of the um, mistakes are still lingering uh, in the training.